Welcome to Podcasts Across Worlds. I'm your host, Lehua Superfina. And I'm the co-host, Spirit, aka Papa Fulu. We are people who like to read a lot of manga and watch a lot of anime. We realize that we all like similar titles and we could talk about them for hours. So here we are in Podcasts Across Worlds to talk about anime, manga, and everything else we're interested in. So we'll start with Ascendance of a Bookworm, since that's like fresher in your mind, I'm assuming. (laughs) Yeah. Well, as fresh as it can be. (laughs) Like I said, I've been unwell for the past bit and ill brain fog, but that's what I've been watching for the past few days. Since you watched it more recent than me, you can explain what it's about. Okay. Well, I wasn't expecting it to be an Izakai. The premise of it was kind of intriguing, where you had a woman who was a bookworm, well, a sentence of a bookworm, and that's all she cared about, her books, and wanted to go to the library and books. And that, ironically, is what kills her. She gets crushed by books. But unlike a lot of other Izakai, when I've watched them, and you get people who are reincarnated, she gets reincarnated in the body of a little girl who's five years old. And the character's name is Mine. But if you look at the Japanese spell of it, it's Main. So is it like the main character? So we're going to call it Main? Uh, Weird. But the girl's body is very frail and very sickly. And as she's reincarnated into this five-year-old body, she's slowly getting the memories of it as well. And what you don't know, and I don't think he ever specifically outright says, is if the little girl died, and the moment that she died, you had the woman who was much older in the other world die, and is that the moment she inhabited the body? But all she wants to care about in the new world is books. And she finds out, like, books aren't for commoners. And books are highly prized because they're having to be handwritten out and hand-bound. And they're not on paper, they're on animal skin. And so only the noble can afford it, which she hates. And her entire being and purpose in the first part of the anime is she wants to get books or make books. So it goes through like trying different methods of it, like clay tablets, wooden tablets, but it always gets thwarted. And every time it is, she has a reaction to it and it causes her to go into like a sort of like a fugue state where she, you'll see her eyes start glowing like a rainbow color and she gets an aura around her. And this is where her fever comes on and it makes her sick. And as it progresses, it find out it's something called the devouring. And that only happens when a commoner has too much mana because mana is only allowed or supposed to be in the bodies of the nobles. And the devouring is when a commoner is born with mana and it's too much for their body to handle. And with that, it's slowly killing her because as the mana builds up and builds up, it's making the body perish. And it seems to be controlled by emotion. So every time she does something and she fails, or something shakes her will and her drive, she goes into this state and then she's bedridden. And I started off watching it and I was writing notes down like, why the fuck am I watching this crap? It started off very, I don't really want to watch this because it's boring. And then it was next episode, next episode, the next episode. And then before I know it, after a couple of days, I've watched 26 episodes and I'm like, holy shit, where's the next series? <laughs> and thankfully, there is a season three that has been confirmed. So in the beginning of the the story, like what made you feel like, why am I watching this? Like, what put you off? I thought it was going to be another generic Izakai. How and so? I, I've watched a lot of Izakai, <laughs> and uh, what I think it's over the past couple of years where 
everything was an izakai. You had some decent, some bad. You had some like izakai cheat magician, which is the most boring and basic of an izakai overpowered you can have. And that's another thing that you have with a lot of izakai is someone is incredibly overpowered. They've got all this strength and everything. And Ascendants of the Bookworm does have that. And because of her mana, she does have this strength because of the Devouring. She gains an ability called the Crushing, which is a buildup of the mana where they can't control it anymore and it can be used to destroy their enemies. But the power she comes in with hers is knowledge from her other world. Like, uh, there's a point where they get coconut type red uh, fruit and all that's used is the milk from it and it's a case of oh so what do you do with the pulp oh it's just bird feed and she comes up with the idea oh maybe if i combine that pulp with some eggs and everything she makes pancakes and pancakes have never existed in this world and it's that overpowered situation but it's kind of different in this fact of instead of strength it's knowledge and that's what kind of kept me going i'm like Oh, so I wonder how else what gets introduced into this world gets added to it and how it changes and how it changes. And because like, when she becomes starts working with the merchant, he's like, I need to buy the rights for that. And if you tell anyone else about this and it, just how he is and wanting to make money, and he's so focused on making money. But there's multiple reasons why. It's money because, yeah, merchants are kind of seen as scummy and all they care about is money but he also wants her to get as much money as she can so she can help get these divider uh, like uh, gem bracelets and everything like that that can help with the devouring and you find out like one of these things costs free i think it's either free large or free small gold coins because they have a money system that's very similar to the japanese yen and it's it just starts off like seems very narrow focus like i i am here i need books i'm like oh if this is going to be a one note thing it's going to be boring but it spreads out to be many other different things there's a lot of different nuances in the story and also the art style is kind of pretty because it kind of reminds me of a, uh have you ever seen seven deadly sins yeah that's what all the characters remind, reminded me of and i was like or is it the same studio that did that? And it's not. And I was like, huh, it looks very similar. But it's very colourful. Uh, I'd say the colour palette is something similar to that time I was reincarnated as a slime. One of my favourite shows. And unlike uh, Yona of the Dawn, I'm making a recall back to that. This... As I've said, Yona of the Dawn had a lot of good ideas, but the pacing was very poor. I think this hit the beats when it needed to hit them. Yeah, there was the slow moments, but when it came to when it needed to speed up, it sped up. Like after she got became part of the church and it went on, it's like a slightly different tangent, but it wasn't. It was still going back to the primary plot point. It's like, yeah, this books are still the main focus and everything, but it's how it happens and how it affects everyone else and other things that she will stop to do just so she can go back to her main things like yeah i want to go back to my books but i need to do this first like it's not just a one trick pony so what i liked about the story was in the beginning yes she is she was one track mind of making a book if she can't afford one then she'll make one but that's how determined she was. And she was using the knowledge from her previous life. And everything she did, something thwarted her. And she'll get so frustrated. But she's like, no, I really want to read a book. For example, when she was making her clay tablets, like she was trying to make clay tablets. So she was gathering all the mud, all the right type of mud it had to be that specific composition to make a clay tablet and then these kids that she was with in the forest because she was supposed to be gathering in the forest with the kids but 
she was instead trying to make clay tablets that the kids, the other kids who were gathering, they like ran over her clay tablets. And she was like so frustrated. Like I was feeling her frustration. Like when she was like squinting her eyes and she was crying and she was like feeling angry. I was like, oh, I don't care about your clay tablets, but I feel your anger. Like and that's some, one of the first moments you notice yeah. her eyes change color. Yeah. Like, she didn't even notice, but everybody else saw it. But that's when us viewers could say, like, hey, there's something special about her. We don't really know what it is, but there's something going on. And they didn't really elaborate on that until, I want to say, like, four episodes in. Where, like, she meets a girl named... Uh, Frida? Yeah. And then Frida's like, oh, you have a Dubaru. And she's like, and mine's like, what's that? And mine just thought that she was just a really frail child. She thought she was reincarnated in a very frail child. Like, mine's body is so frail that she couldn't even walk a certain distance. Like, that's how frail this body was. And that was another thing that frustrated her. Like, she had all these knowledge that required manual labor. Like, for example, making the clay tablets. She got tired from gathering the mud mm. to make and, the clay tablets. And what also added to the frustration is the whole point of her going to the forest and she was, wasn't even supposed to be making the clay tablets is her dad, because knowing how frail she was, says he would only let her go there if she slowly built up her stamina. So it was also an ordeal for her to get to the point where she can actually go to the forest to get the clay. And it's like anything that would take us maybe a couple of minutes to, oh, I'm going to walk down the road. It was a ordeal for her. So it's a higher, it's a higher ledge to fall from whenever she failed. And for her, it's like she has all of these aspirations, all these things she wants to do, and she knows she can do it, but her own body is limiting her, and she gets so frustrated with that. And fortunately, she meets this boy named Lutz. And he's actually interested in what she's doing. He's like, huh, actually... Well, I don't know what you want, mine, but I want to help you with it. I want to, I want to help you make whatever you want to make. And at first, he was, he was just being nice, right? He was like, yeah, I'll be nice to the weak girl. But then later on, like when she made the pancakes for him and his brothers, because they're like a big family. They're, they're, they are a typical like farming or old school family where they pop out a lot of kids to use them as workers. The so mother's a conveyor belt. So he has a family of that. But the thing is, they're always low on food because there's just so many mouths to feed. And so when mine made the pancakes that she thinks is common for her, but for them, it's like, what is this? We can make these ourselves with these things that we use to feed the birds? What? He's like, okay, she knows things. I want to help her make everything else she knows about. So that's where their relationship started. And he became her body. <laughs> it's weird saying that her body. Um, he did the physical work for her. She was the brains. He was the bronze. Mm. Well, there was the packs and everything where he would make whatever she came up with. And he developed a little crush on her. Yeah, he did. He did develop a crush on her. Yeah. You you can see that later on. Especially um ah. Oh, I don't know what episode it was, but he thought that they were going to be separated. Oh, when she was gonna enter the temple. But we'll get to that part later. Well, there's a couple moments like that as well, also. When he find when he comes to the realization 
mine's not mine. It's this Japanese woman called Arano. And he's like, you're not mine, are you? And he, it's kind of weird that the five-year-old realizes this before the parents, but I feel like the parents are just blinded to the fact that, well, the dad even says he's just happy that his daughter's up about doing stuff. But I still think it's weird. You've got an older Japanese woman reincarnated into a five-year-old and the relationship she has with Lutz. I don't think it's weird because if you think about it, back... So, let's just describe the setting. The setting is that these people, they're not primitive, but they're very far behind in technology. And this is the mm-hmm. time where people, like kids, maybe when they're like 12, they get married. Yeah, this like, this, is, this is the time period for that. So, they tend to grow up pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, so, like dark to middle ages type time yeah. frame. Yeah, like that's that's how far back in time mine is in, where they don't know paper yet, and that's where her and Lutz start working. They start working to make papers because mine tried to make clay tablets that didn't work. She tried to make what was it? What was she trying to do with those sticks that her mom burnt? Uh, wooden tablets, like connect them together, like a uh, Chinese type wooden scroll. Try to make wooden tablets, but that didn't work because her mom kept burning the, the sticks that she was collecting. Tried to make papyrus. Tried to make that, and <laughs> but it was too long for her, and her sister wouldn't keep helping her because all you ever heard of was like two day, <laughs> and she's his sister's trying to do her own thing. And mine kept asking her sister because mine was low on energy because she has a weak body. And mine was always inventing things that she had knowledge on to make her life easier. So her hair, let's use her hair as an example. She didn't like the way her hair felt. She didn't like the way her body felt. She was thinking, okay, if my body's dirty, then that's going to affect my health. I need to clean my body. I need to clean my hair. And she figured out how to make shampoo and conditioner, which made her hair healthy and shiny. And that stayed within her family until one day when she's hanging out with what is the guy's name? The one that works with her dad, Otto. Or Otto. Oh, Mr. Otto. Otto. So she was like with Otto. And Otto used to be a traveling merchant. And coincidentally, mine's friend, Lutz, wants to be a traveling merchant. Otto and mine knew each other because mine's dad was working as like a soldier. And Otto was the type of accountant with the soldiers, the guards. And whenever mine went with her dad to work, she'll hang out with Otto. And that's where she was able to learn how to read and write because reading and writing is not a very common thing with commoners. So she developed a relationship with Otto. And this relationship started because she really wanted to read books. But she didn't know how to read or write but the language. She doesn't know the language of this world. She knows the language back on Earth, but not in this world. So she has that relationship with Otto to learn how to read and write. And then once she learns that Otto was a traveling merchant and Lutz wants to be a traveling merchant, she's like, hey, let me have them talk. So when they finally met up, Lutz and Otto, Otto also brought a friend. And this friend is named Benno. This is a merchant that Spirit was talking about. So when Otto was talking to Lutz saying, don't be a traveling merchant, being a traveling merchant isn't the greatest because you lose your citizenship. And traveling merchants want to be citizens. So it doesn't make sense to lose your citizenship just to be, just to work hard to be a, to become a citizen. You're working harder, not smarter. So that didn't work out, being a traveling merchant. But Benno has that eye 
you know, that eye of observing, that eye to appraise things. And he noticed that mine's hair looked very healthy, very shiny for a commoner. So he inquires about it. It's like, how's your hair so nice? Like, he's like so straightforward. He's like, what's that thing in your hair? How are you holding up your hair with that stick? Why is your hair so nice? And she like explains. She's like, uh, I can't tell you everything. You'll have to buy it. <laughs> she like starts <laughs> like ugly arguing with him. And she knew it. She knew this was going to happen. You, she knew that this was going to be helpful for her because she washed Lutz's hair before this meeting. She knew that this was going to catch mm. someone's attention. I have to say, Benno is one of the best characters in this series. I like Benno. I <laughs> love Benno. <laughs> well, what was really funny towards the beginning, which involves um, Mr. Otto, was that it's, I'm going to call it, because it's how it acted, the little love triangle between mine, her dad, and Mr. Otto. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was so funny. Like He gives mine a slate tablet and a slate pencil so she can write. And so, okay, so dad comes in. Mine, are you all right? He's like, yeah, I love Mr. Otto. Just giving him slate tablet. And he becomes one of the most jealous things imaginable. And any time I was brought up by mine and everything like that, you just see all the joy in his face just slowly drain. <laughs> and one of the ways he's trying to dissuade her one day when he's taking her to the uh, the, like the, the wall, the gate, I was just saying, mine, you know that he only thinks about his wife. And? Well, that's all he thinks about, all his wife, and he's having probably a, impure thoughts and everything and the wife's all that's on his mind and he said oh so you mean he's a, a good person and really attentive and cares about the people he loves and dad the dad just goes no <laughs> just, <laughs> that relationship towards the beginning and any time the dad gets to help after that because he's getting attention from mine he jumps the chance and he started off being a character that seemed very secondary and like Oh, it's just written to be a father figure. But he becomes one of the most likable characters in the series. He's so expressive. And he just adores his daughters. It's like, oh, like compared to their mom, the mom is more strict. And not going to lie, I didn't like mine's mom at first because she kept burning mine sticks to mine sticks that she wants to use. As like a bamboo book, and I was like, ah, I had a very bad impression of a mom. I was like, you're so mean. You're always breaking her dreams. Like, leave mine stuff alone. <laughs> but then, but then, when mine used her knowledge from Earth and was making these hair ornaments using thread or string. And then the mom was like, oh, what's this? And she started appreciating Mine's innovations. Quote, innovations, quote. The reason why I'm saying quote is because it wasn't really Mine's original idea, but in that world, it seems like it. And so anyway. That, <laughs> that's also a moment the dad helps in as well, because that's where she gets him to create a crochet hook. Right, right. And the dad was like so happy to be involved and being able to, being able to help her, he's like, oh, "You need help? What? What do you want me to do? Like, I'll do anything for you." He was like that. It's like, "You're a good dad." <laughs> Just like a little puppy that gets attention. It's like, what else do you want me to do? You want me to fetch something? I can fetch you something. <laughs> <laughs> so when that part where mine was making that hair ornament with the thread and crocheting and the mom was getting interested in that and the mom wanted to help too and the dad was able to make the crochet needle and then making the hair clip it just felt like that mine was finally being accepted in her family because the moments where she was trying to make a book or trying to be herself in this foreign world her family was viewing her weird they're like what are you what are you talking about why why do you need this? Why do you need that? It I felt sorry for mine. Like I really felt sorry for her for being thrown into this world 
and not being accepted or understanded. Like, no one was understanding her except for Lutz. And Lutz was like, I don't know, but I believe in you. But at that moment, when she was making that hair ornament for her sister, for her sister's baptism, it was that moment where it was finally she was being accepted. And for me, it felt like that she was going to do, she was going to, she was going to be okay in this world. Because before that, I felt like she was not going to survive. I was like, oh my gosh, she is going to struggle for the rest of her life. <laughs> I don't know how this girl is going to do it. But I, I would like to see it through. <laughs> I'm just imagining you if it did end up like that, you watching the series and her being like the same as the protagonist from Mahoshi Ojo site. <laughs> Why are you so pathetic? <laughs> <laughs> well, like, okay. So even though she wasn't pathetic by choice, though, like mentally she wasn't pathetic. It was her body. <laughs> like she was really strong in the mind. Her mentality was amazing. For example, for example, let's use a devouring. The devouring. So she would get hit with like heavy fevers to the point where she faints. She's falling asleep. When you see these scenes, you literally see her in this black void world. And you're seeing this cloud of magic. You don't know it's magic yet. You just think it's like the fever trying to like take over her body and kill her. But then she like starts to suppress it. And she's imagining a box. And she's suppressing the fever. She's suppressing the fever into the box. Like she's like willing it. Like that's how strong her mentality is. Because you do find one of the characters are surprised that she isn't dead. Because with the devouring to keep it at bay. They state you need strong willpower for it to happen. Like one of the times where she has a fever and she's ready to just give up and die, basically. She remembers the promise she made with Lutz to make book sell books together. And using that, she managed to suppress the fever. And it came back a few times after where she's like bed bound for a couple of days, but it's the last, it's the only big in you see until the next main plot story point, which is where she has the next turn in. Um, oh, I can't remember where she was, but she was taken to free. Uh, da, da, da. Frida's yeah. place. And it's explained what the devouring is and the only way that a lot of common people with the devouring can get by is, making a pact with a noble because it's either you do that or you die the reason why you would need to make a pact with the noble is because remember when spirit shock was talking about these bracelets these juries that help with the devouring so these accessories the reason why they help with the devouring is because it absorbs the mana that the commoners can't handle because the commoners are just overflowing with it and they're not using it because they don't know magic. So it's just, just building up, building up to the point where it can devour, AKA kill the commoner. So there's these accessories that can absorb that mana so that the commoner can't be overloaded and die. And these accessories cost money and who can afford these Accessories, nobles. So the reason why these people, these commoners who have the devouring, need to make a contract with a noble because the nobles can buy the accessories. It's the only way. <laughs> and one of the fucked up things you also find out about the the gems that the commoners get to get their hands on. They're, the only reason that they're able to buy them is the scene is defective and not suitable for a noble. So even though commoners can get them, it's a they're a one use moment. So that's why they have to keep buying them and keep buying them because they're not good enough for us. We'll sell them to the commoners with a devouring. 
which shows you there is a lot, a lot of divide, like it's a racial divide between commoners and poor people. Like there is disdain and hatred to commoners. Which we don't see until later on. I want to say in season two. Because season one is just focusing on mine and her books. <clears throat> like, you kind of hear about the class differences. And you kind of get the backstory of this world she's in. Because they do explain how the city she lives in is structured. And at first, you're like, okay, so this is the poor section. That's the rich, rich section. Okay, we'll never see the rich section ever. And when I say the rich section, I mean the noble section. So we're like totally, okay, they kind of gloss over that. And for, I don't know about you, Spare, but for me, I didn't think she was ever going to venture into the noble world. I thought she was going to die. Me too. Me too. <laughs> I thought... It was going to get to the point where she decided she didn't want to get attached to a noble. She was because she gets told if she doesn't, she's got a year left. I yeah. thought she was going to make enough money for her family, then go up, <laughs> then die basically, and then get maybe get reincarnated again. That's the sort of impression I was getting when I well, first time watching it. So, the reason why I got the impression that she was dying was because when Frida, a girl who's actually in a merchant family, a very successful merchant family, Frida also has a devouring, but her family made a contract with a noble family so she could survive. So Frida is going to be with nobles. Like she was betrothed, quote, betrothed, quote. <laughs> Not so much betrothed, more she's going to be a concubine, so mistress. So dark, gee. Yeah, she was going to be somebody's... Well, if you think that's kind of dark, well, have you watched... No, you haven't watched all the second season, have you? I have watched the second season. Oh, yeah. Well, you have watched the second season. Well, do you know that little redhead girl that becomes the retainer? Yes. Her goal in life is to be the concubine of the the like the Lord Priest or the High Priest and everything like that, who's an old, old guy with long white hair and big bushy beard. And her aspect in life, because how that is, is to be his mistress. Because that's what all they can aspire to be is. And she's happy with that. So Spirit just jumped way, way ahead in the story. <laughs> I know I'm jumping ahead in the story, but I'm talking about no And the orphanage! The orphanage! Oh my god! Follow the timeline! <laughs> I know, but we're talking dark stuff! <laughs> they don't even say she's gonna... Okay, so the reason why I'm saying he's jumping ahead because with Frida, they don't even say... It can be sorted out in the editing. No, it's not! That's too much work for me, you asshole! <laughs> You 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 don't edit. You don't know. <laughs> so back to this. So I, I hope in, all this is kept in. <laughs> in the story, they don't even say that Frida is going to be a mistress. They no, like, they do. They do. They say that when mine's telling her when Frida's talking to mine in the bedroom after she has that fit, and when she's getting going to become a concubine, which is a mistress. But she's happy because she'll be able to open up her own store in the Noble District. Do they say concubine? They say concubine. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So they do say it. Yeah. it's That's kind of where it's attached to it. And she's like, she's, you can tell she's upset about it, but she's happy that she'll be able to open up her own store in the Noble District. But she'll be nothing more than a noble's mistress. So when he says like she'll be able to be a no, she'll be able to open a store. The deal is she'll be a mistress or concubine, but they'll still give her the freedom to open a store. That's the backstory behind that, because her father is not father. Her grandfather is the guild master. 
I don't know if he's the merchant guild master, but he's a, a high, well-to-do merchant. No, well, they have to answer to him. Is he the guild master? He runs oh. the guild. Okay, Gustav. He's like the yeah, boss. yeah, 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 yeah. He's the Gustav, head of the merchant guild. I have the yeah. character list. <laughs> yeah. So, um, before we even meet Frida, Benno, the merchant that mine has a relationship with a business relationship <clears throat> business relationship uh benno had a suspicion that she had a devouring and so benno is very helpful with her in a i want to say in a sundere way like he's helping her but he's also being harsh to her at the same time and you don't know why he keeps pushing her. <laughs> like, he gets angry with her. And we need fun out of Benno saying Baka. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so Benno, he, he appreciates all the inventions she has. And he's, every time when she invents something, he's like, I want you to tell me first. Mm. And he's always buying the rights from her or buying her products or making deals with her. Like he's always doing that with her. And you're like wondering like why why does he keep doing this with her? And then later on you find out that he knows that she has a the devouring and he knows that it costs money to buy these accessories that will help her with the divari. So this whole time that he was buying and selling with her, he was thinking about that in the back of his head. He was thinking, okay, how am I going to help her to make money so she doesn't die? And it's like, oh, fudge. He was thinking that far ahead for her. Which you don't know until later on. Like nothing is obvious in this show or this story. Yeah, certain characters you think have got ulterior motives do, but not in the way you'd think that it had. Right. Like I originally thought Benno was just trying to use her for money. Right, right. And no, he's just trying to screw the system so she can have money. And he does care about money because like in a situation where Jumping ahead a little bit. But when cake's made and Frida buys the exclusive rights to it for a year and he's pissed off that he hasn't got the rights to it because he he kind of wants all of mine's things because it'll make him money. But in other situations, he does help her out. Like when they first start working together and they're trying to make paper there's a contract that's written up and he kind of acts like, oh, no, I don't want to do this, but you can kind of tell he does. And that's mine and Lutz have exclusive rights to manufacture the paper and Lutz has exclusive rights to sell it. And the contracts done in this world, you think, oh, they're bringing out this special ink and it's like, how pretentious can Noble Spit? You have to have special ink for contracts. And it's not, it's, this is one of the first ways you find out about magic is they write the name down with this ink and it's blue. Then they prick the finger and use their blood to seal it and the ink turns black. And once the contract's done, it kind of disintegrates in fire. And there's, one of the things he's mentioned, I can't remember what, if it's mentioned around the same time or not, but it's a, oh, what can happen to someone if they break a contract? And Ben was like, oh, in worst case scenario, they forfeit the life. Oh, yeah, it was explained at that scene. But it's kind of like, so these contracts that are made are <laughs> it's more than legally binding. And it's one of the first indications of magic in the series. In fact, there's magic explained a lot in that episode because you also find out about those metal tokens that merchants can use for money transactions and magic doors. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, Benno is a crafty cunt, but he is actually looking out for mine. You can tell. And he's constantly harassing her and everything. And it's like, it feels like constantly telling her, like, you're an imbecile and everything like that. But he learns to, he becomes very caring of her because he knows if she pushes her to herself, how ill she can become. And I believe he's the first person. Yeah, he's the, is the first person who knows it's the devouring. Yeah, he is. And so when he finds out all this, it's like, okay, I'm going to help her. As Lewis said, it's, I'm going to help her. I'm going to help her get her money, everything like that. But he doesn't play it off that way. He still plays it off like the smarmy businessman. And I like his assistant as well. His assistant's amazing. Oh, that quiet one? The yeah, one yeah. That's stealthily. <laughs> yeah, I love the assistant. But it's certain characters who you think have got ulterior motives don't. But certain characters who you think, oh, they seem like a really nice person. Oh, you 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 want to hit him with a baseball bat. So later on, when Mine learns that she has a devouring from Frida. Frida tells her, okay, if you don't make a contract with a noble or if you can't get your hands on these accessories that will help absorb the devouring, you will die. And they gave like a time frame, like two years. Yeah. And so mine was, mine had that life crisis thing. Okay. Do I want to chain myself to a noble and live? Or do I just want to live the rest of my life as happily as I can and die? And she chose choice number two. She chose to just spend time with her family for the two remaining years she has and die. She like she was like dead set on that. And so she told her family, which was so heartbreaking. That was a very heartbreaking scene where she tells her family that she has a devouring and she only has oh so much time to live. Because you see her mother sad. Her mom's like, my baby, like, I thought you died, but you lived. And now I'm being told that you are going to die. And you have this sister who's like mad. She's like, why do you have to die? Why don't you stay alive? And mine's like, if I stay alive, then I have to be with nobles and I'll be away from you. Life doesn't matter if I have to stay away from my family. And it's just so weird to see like a little girl say that because it's way too mature for her. But we have to remember that this is like an adult woman in this little girl's body. And the part that I was like anxious about was when she was telling her father. The father who dotes on her. The father who wants to be useful to her is being told that his daughter will die and he can't do anything about it. And at first he's like a little upset, you know, but he's like toughing it out. But then after everybody goes to sleep, he's like taking some sips of alcohol and he's just crying. He's bawling. This grown tough man is just bawling. Oh, that was heartbreaking. But then, you know, they're like, you know what? We'll just make the best of it. This time we can be together. Because the family understood where mine was coming from. And that was a very touching scene. And afterwards, they played it off like nothing was going to happen because that was that was leading up to mine's baptism. Right. Which I think around the baptism time, that was around a year that she had been mine. Yeah, it was. And so everything's... The play, everything's going normal. The take... Okay, can I just say that a sister's got one of the stupidest names ever? <laughs> Tooley? <laughs> if, you, if you watch the dub, it's Tootie. 
No. If you watch the dub, it's Tooty. I I have not watched the dub. Tooty. <laughs> the dub no, no, is no, Tooty. No, no. No, why did they change it? Why couldn't they just say it's Turi or something? I mean, why? It might be Tuli, but in the dub, and you hear everyone say it, it sounds like Tuti. I remember a flavor of ice cream called Tutti Fruity. That's the name of an ice cream, not a fucking person. <laughs> well, She's taking in Julie's dress and everything's checked. She's got a new hair pin that was made for her to go with her dress and all that. And oh, that's something that we didn't mention. One of the things that brings mine into popularity and everything like that is everyone noticed her sister's headpiece. Mm -hmm. And everyone wanted it. And that's one of the things that started the relationship between mine and uh, da -da, uh, Frida. And I liked the fact that Frida wears her hair in pigtails. And so she's like, oh, you can, that's how you're going to wear your hair on the day. She went, yeah, so oh, we're going to have to make two then. Uh, and mine's just like, oh, well, I'll I'll do the second one for free. And Frida's like, no, I'm going to pay you. And they're having a back and forth. And he's kind of like, no, I'm doing it for free. No, I'm paying you. And Lutz is like, half price. And then fucking Benno gets mad that it was half price and not full price. Because he thinks yeah. now everyone's going to expect stuff half price and free. And that's just him being his merchant self. But back to baptism. But yeah, it's getting to mine's baptism and everything like that. And it's kind of sweet as you see all the children parading down the street, knowing that mine's not strong enough to walk that far. You see the dad carrying her to the cathedral. And um, so remember that spirit said that mine took Tuli's dress so basically, she modified it so it'll look different. And she, again, used her knowledge from her previous life and made some modifications to the dress to the point where it looks like a commoner should not be able to afford it. And this is the part that I did like. Uh, so the father was carrying her, right? And everybody that knew mine was there, there to congratulate her be there for her special occasion, her baptism. She's going to be not a child anymore after she's baptized. She's going to be in the working world if she can, if she can. And Benno's there. Otto's there with his wife. And Benno sees mine's dress. And he's like, what is that? You are showing everybody this dress and you didn't tell me first that you made this? Like, mine, what, is, what are you doing? <laughs> like, he had that, he had that baka look. He, he has that moment so many times. He had that look where he wanted to yell at her. <laughs> <clears throat> I think we can make that a drinking game how many times Benno gets upset with mine. <laughs> And uh, you know, you just you know that you know that look, you know what's going on, but you know it's mine's baptism. She's got she's got to go to the temple. <laughs> she can't stay there and talk to Benno about it. So she goes to the temple, and then she meets up with Lutz, and they go to the temple. And this is where I think this was a foreshadowing where people were saying that they look like a couple. Because they were holding hands and they were both wearing white. And since they were going into the temple, it, to the adults, they are like saying, oh, it's so cute. It looks like they're going to get married. And, you know, you have her father be like, what? What are you talking about? No. No one can get married. Not without my permission. No, <laughs> mine will never get married. <laughs> it, it was that moment. But it was kind of like a foreshadowing. And... Uh, correct me if I was if I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, like this was the last episode of season one. 
Like they kind of left it there. But there is uh, more to episode after that. Yes, I believe so. So, so if that was the last episode of the season, it could have just left it there if the show didn't do so well. And you could interpret it as like, okay, later on, if mine does live, they will end up together. You could interpret it as that. But fortunately, there's a season two and more, more happened. A lot more happened after that. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, season one doesn't end there. I'm looking it up. Okay, so that wasn't the last episode. <laughs> no, <it> yeah. <laughs> season w- one episode is uh, where, do you know where the meeting, where they go into the, where the parents have to go to the church to meet the main priest there? Oh, okay, okay, okay. We'll talk about that. So let's, let's rush to this. So <laughs> somehow, Mine ends up talking to the high priest and she looks like a, a noble's child. And mine finds out that they have a library. And she's like, oh my gosh, you have a library. I want to be in the library. And they tell her, you can't be in the library. You have to be part of the temple. And she's like, well, how do I be part of the temple? And they're like, well, you make a donation and then you become a priestess. And she's like, I can do that. How much does it cost? One gold? I have a gold. And they're like, One gold is more than enough. So they're like, okay, talk to your parents. And then we'll have a meeting. And we'll talk about your whole acceptance into the temple. Right? Mm -hmm. And so she talks to Benno about it. And Benno's like, wait, does she talk to Benno about it? About going to the temple? Yeah, she's talking to Benno about joining the temple and everything. that, And also that they're interested in having her join. Because she touched that grail and the crystal lit, which shows she has mana. And which made them point, her more. Yeah, and they're like, oh, well, she's a noble. We'll have her in. We'll have her in these blue robes and everything. And Benno's just like, you idiot, yet again. <laughs> and trying to get her like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? If you do this, you join the church, you're going to have to give up everything and you're not going to be able to be a merchant. So what you need to do is, you need to go to the church. You need to play up your frailty. You need to talk about if you've got your merchant stuff, you can have a donation going into the guild, uh, the church and everything like that. So you can have like a tithe sort of thing. And he's telling her all to this. And this is one of the moments where I was like, Benno, you are actually a really, really, really good guy. He said, <clears throat> create a contract with Lutz. And Lutz has exclusive permission for all the ideas he he's allowed to do it all and only laws which means the church would not be able to touch any of her stuff because these contracts are not just like mag- uh, legally but magically binding and you can't go against them then after talking to benno mine tells her parents that she wants to join the temple and the parents like no you can't join the temple and she's like why and they're just so against it and she explains that she'll be happy there. They have these relics that can observe the devouring. She'll be able to live longer. And they're just so adamant about her not joining the temple. And then finally the father breaks down and he says, only orphans join the temple. And she's like, what? He's like, yeah. Only orphans join there and they get treated badly. And I don't want you to be treated badly. And she explains, well, I'm not going to be treated bad. I'm going to have a blue robe. Like, they're going to make me a priestess. And they're like, hmm, well, we'll go to the meeting with you. But we're, we're still not sure about it. And mine still doesn't like know how severe this is until the meeting actually happened. And us viewers, we don't know how severe this is until the meeting also. So at the meeting, what happens is the high priest or head priest has a meeting with mine and her parents. And the head priest realizes that mine is actually a commoner. 
and he his attitude his demeanor changes it does like a 180 and us viewers we're like confused like wait what's going on and it's revealed that he views commoners lowly like really low i want to say he dismisses minds like well whatever like we need you because we need you to pour your magic into these relics and you're not going to be treated how i thought you deserve to be treated you're going to be treated poorly and the parents are like oh hell no because this was exactly what they were worried about and so the father was going to fight the head priest and then the head priest is like arrest them take them to prison and the father fights back the guards and then mine's like what are you doing what are you doing to my family and then that's when her mana her mana yeah her mana goes out of control and she gets access to ability as part of the devouring known as the crushing and that's where her mana can be used to defeat her enemies and right now she sees the head priest as her enemy and you just see him like on the floor in pain like he's not able to breathe getting all like purple in the cheeks and everything and She's going to kill him, but the head priest, not the head priest, is it the high, head, head or high? The one with blue hair, he is talking to her and everything like that and manages to calm her down and apologizes for everything that the head priest does and speaks to the family and everything like that and explains certain situations and all that and agrees to all of their conditions of mind joining the church. High priest, he die. He needs to die. Brutal <laughs> death. I hate him too. He's very corrupt. <laughs> oh. Uh, oh, season so, two, he gets so much worse. So uh, the head priest, the blue hair guy that we're talking about, his name is Ferdinand. 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 And he's very... <clears throat> what's described as him is Ferdinand is described as a sharp minded, calm and dignified individual. So he comes across as, as a lot older than he really is leading many people to be surprised by his real age. So he's very strict and he has like a really good poker face. Like he's all about business and every now and then his thoughts come through. Like when they're, through the negotiations where mine was making her demands for her contract. And she mentions that she has a business and he's like, what do you need a business for? And she's like, well, I can give some of my profits, donate some of my profits to the temple. And then Vernon is like thinking this, he's thinking, wait, does she know that we're in like a financial situation? he's like, whatever. Okay, agreed. Agreed. You can have your business. And we don't realize how bad their financial situation is until later on in season two. Like, it's bad. So, what we're trying to say is watch season two. Because it gets darker. Right. And then in season two, this is where they explain more about the treatment between commoners and the nobles like it's it's bad it's really bad I was say uh what really shows that is the penultimate episode so the thing is with mine she was able to make her paper paper check now she can make her books and in season two, she is able to make a book. Okay, making a book. Check. But then now in season two, it's not all focused around her making a book or her love for books because since she did enter the temple, she is able to access a library that has books. So books, check. You know, the go her life is fulfilled. You think it's like, okay, the end, happy ending. No. The story expands more. It expands to 
mine and the world she is now. Mm. The... So there's like more to it. The church is not a very nice place. No, so like let's revisit the part where spirit skipped like a half hour half hour ago. <laughs> we were talking dark shit, and yes. dark shit happened in season two. So let's explain about this church, this temple. I keep calling it a temple because it's a temple, it's, it's not really called a church. It is a it, real well, <laughs> they call it three things. It's a church, a temple, and a cathedral. So it's kind of like make your mind up. So the there is a caste system. There's the head, there's like the bad guy priest. There's a head priest, there's priests and priestesses, and there's apprentices. Hmm. Apprentices are normally, usually, not normally, usually orphans. And the temple has an orphanage. You think like they just take in orphans and they're like, yeah, we're giving you an opportunity to have a home and food. So you're thinking, okay, this temple is pretty cool. They give these orphans shelter and food and they give them a job there is like a purpose to their life but then you see how the apprentices are being treated like they're being treated like servants slaves mm -hmm. so you're like oh that's kind of shitty oh, i hate that bit i hate how they well it's that well written there's certain things i genuinely hate where the like who was mentioning the fact that there's the caste system, and you've got your, your nobles all wear like blue outfits because that represents the water goddess, and the commoners wear grey and it denotes them. And there is a bit of prejudice against mine because she's a commoner wearing blue. But right. what happens is, is you have when mine first becomes a apprentice priestess, she gets given what is called retainers which are grey-clothed people that attend to the blues. And then when you find out about the food situation, that's fucked. Okay, so we find out what the food situation through Mind's retainer, Gil. So Gil expects to get food from her, but we don't know this. Mm. We don't know this until later on. Because... The way it's explained to you is the nobles or the blue shirts eat. And what's ever left on their plate goes to the retainers. And that whatever the retainers don't eat goes to the unbaptized orphans. And throughout what everything that's been happening, as it mentions in season one, the fact that there's less and less nobles. And at the start of season two, you also find out there's less nobles entering the clergy. So there's less food left on plates. And when you first see inside the orphanage, that's a fucking heart-wrenching scene. Uh, so when mine is a priestess for the first time, she's like, yay, I can go to the library. I can read the books. And her retainer, Gil, who has an attitude towards her, he goes to the library and he says hey you need to eat and she's like I don't want to eat I'm not hungry and he's like no you need to eat she's like leave me alone I don't want to eat I just want to read my books and he gets upset and he just storms off and you're like what's his damage then later on mine learns about the whole food, food distribution system and she feels Horrible. She's like, oh my gosh, I starved Gil. Like she didn't mean to. Like he was he was being a shitty brat. But he didn't deserve to be starved. And so once she finally understood the culture of the temple, we're gonna call it a culture because it is a culture. It's like a whole new world. A whole new world. <laughs> Not so, a fantastic point of view. <laughs> so she learns about this culture. And instead of just giving Gil food, she implements the idea that 
he needs to work for his food. And it works. It's a great system that she established. And this is where the story kind of like expands from her whole book world because she was like totally in tunnel vision. But now that she's a priestess in the temple, she has to learn about this world, a world of nobles, a world in the temple and everything that's going on. So that was fascinating because she didn't know how grave her situation was until it was explained to her by Benno. Like, for example, she goes to visit Benno and she's walking around in her blue robes and Benno like sees her. Well, first is Benno's assistant and Benno's assistant like is freaking out. and He grabs her right away. Brings her to the office, and Benno sees her wearing her blue blue robes too. He's like, "Why are you wearing that?" And she says, "Well, I don't have a change of clothes." And he's like, "Do you understand that you could have been kidnapped because people will think you're a noble?" And she's like, "What?" And he's like telling her she's stupid and whatnot, <laughs> and like that. This is where how ignorant she was. But it's not her fault because no one explained it to her. She doesn't know how nobles work. She doesn't know what happens. She only knows about her commoner life. So let's break it down. She is reincarnated as a little girl, as a commoner in like this middle age world. So she has to learn how to adapt in this primitive world. And then she has to deal with the fact that she's dying. Then she learns that she can live and she can live by being a temple. But now she has to learn how to survive and work with the system in the temple and know how nobles work and how to act or... There are certain rules of conduct that you kind of have to follow. Yeah, There you go. Conduct herself amongst commoners and amongst nobles. So she has to adapt again. And it's fascinating. Like... The cor- you find out the correct way that a f- specifically a female noble speaks to a male and always ends it with thank you kindly. So it shows there's also a divide in the sex as well as no- nobility status. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. With all this going on, mine has been very fortunate in the position she's in. People were, re- were reluctant to have her being a blue robe priestess, but she got it. Now she has privileges, but she also has responsibilities. She's responsible for her gray robe retainers. And these gray robe retainers were in the orphanage where they had to wait for the leftovers of leftovers, right? Yes, yeah, something like, oh, what's the call? Something like God's bounty or something. I can't remember exactly what. So this is where we go back to one of her retainers. And her name is Delia. Her name is Delia. And she was actually, she's actually a child. Mm -hmm. She's She's roughly the same age as mine. And she was put there by the bishop, which is the evil head priest guy. He's actually a bishop. I finally just looked it up and he's a bishop. So he was put there to be a spy. And this is where Spirit was talking about her, her, how she aspires to be his mistress. And as Spirit described the bishop, he is an old, fat, bushy beard, old man. Delia aspires to be his mistress. She thinks that is the best she can do. And like it's so it's like so sad and that also shows another moment that happens later on where Delia is also trying to show mine what she can do and it turns out seducing all the men seems to be one of the thing one of her duties that the bishop had to do because she sits on Benno's lap and's like oh well I know what I'm doing here and tries to do it in a seductive way and he's just like nope that was so creepy. That was like really, really creepy. Yeah. Like 
guys, you don't know how creepy that was. <laughs> like, she automatically went to sit on Benno's lap. And, like, that was what she was meant to do. She was meant to just sit there, be pretty, mm. and just let them pet her. It's and so creepy. It's, it's one of those moments when you see her do that, it's kind of like, what else has he made her do? Right? Because you do find out... Uh, I don't know if... I'm, Okay, I, you, you find out about the corruption of the church, but there's one character in it specifically. I can't remember if the way it's shown if she was raped. Oh, yes, yes. I know who you're talking about. Or because they said it, it tricked her. The words they used tricked her into giving them her flower. Yes, yeah, she was which, tricked to give her flower. Yes. Yeah, so it's kind of but the way she acts about it and the sort of like flashback scene that you're given, it looks like she was more forced into it. it. Like she was raped by her previous. Well, she was the retainer for, and you find out she has a fear of men due to it. And it's just showing you that some of that started off as a little girl wanting books becomes what it does. I feel like that because mine learned of that, what happened to that retainer, it's going to play a big part later on in the story because at the end of season two, mine is sent out on a, what was it, like expedition? Uh, she go, oh, when she goes to bless the land with that tree. Yeah, because there's <clears throat> that plant that started to overgrow yeah there's a there's a certain plant in this world where it okay i'm kind of curious about this plant because she touches a fruit that looks like a tomato and it becomes this plant because it absorbs her mana well so, what the plant does is when it when it's fully grown it's like absorbing all the life force and that's how it grows. It's just sucking up the life force. So what I think it is when it's just a seed pod, because mine is just overflowing with mana, it like, it absorbed it. Because mm. it just seems like she touches this tomato plant and it becomes this weird parasitic tree. Which is coincidentally the best way to make paper, because it makes a high quality paper. Right, right. <laughs> Well, what is the name of this plant? I want to say it starts with a R. Like, it's like Wanda or something. Like a trundle or a trundler or something stupid. Okay. It's a foreign word. Anyway, so there's... um, So, there that plant that we're talking about, it grew. It grew, like, really huge, and it started to, like, suck out the life force all around its vicinity, and it's so bad that soldiers have to be sent out. And this is the first time we've ever seen them, like like noble soldiers. And the reason why I'm saying they're noble soldiers is because it's because they can use magic. So there's the soldiers, like her father, the commoners, that watch the gate, they're guards. And then there's the noble soldiers who go out to suppress these trees there are like life-sucking trees yeah so, the, the so night you, god or something yeah so knights that can actually use magic are needed for this and this is the first time we actually seen lots of magic being used like we saw like teeny weeny magic stuff going on like communication putting mana into objects like really small stuff like this one was like abracadabra shit you know we see like mounts being manifested through magic we're like what you guys could do this this whole time and we got mine over here being like when can i learn that i got all this magic how come i didn't learn this and Fernandez like you're not ready like you're too much trouble with all this knowledge you got you're not ready so anyways in this scene 
this is where we see that there's like a very strong prejudice and discrimination between nobles and commoners because the knights were sent out to suppress the life-sucking tree a tromba tromba yes or toromba if you're japanese oh toromba toromba oh no wonder i thought instead of the r because i keep seeing the rumba part <laughs> so the toromba toromba the toromba the roomba <laughs> it's a life-sucking vacuum <laughs> <laughs> anyways, anyways, so the Turomba <laughs> is sucking the life out, and so the knights are sent out, friend that is sent out, but mine needs to be guarded. So they left two knights with her. One knight's being really nice and like talking to her, explaining things. And you know, they all think she's a noble because she's wearing a blue robe. But then they learned that she's actually a commoner. And so the other knight has a prejudice against commoners. So he starts treating her badly. He's like, well, what you going to do? You're a commoner. And I don't know what happened, but she gets cut. And her uh, he, well, the, the knight guard or whatever they're called, I can't remember. They've got like wands that they can turn into blades. And uh, this guy's threatening her and everything. I was like, maybe I'll gouge out your eyes. And he's constantly going towards her with a knife. And as she does that, she kind of like winces away or moves and it ends up cutting her. Because he's going to attack her. And when that happens, her blood drops. And uh, for some reason, a Turoma was somewhere under the ground, absorbed her blood, which had her mana in it. And it just grew. And it wrapped around her. And it this was like a oh shit moment. Fortunately... The rest of the knights in front of that arrive and they free her and they're like, what happened here? And this is where that noble almost got away with it because of this whole discrimination thing going on because of the whole caste system. Like when people like talk about like privileges and whatnot, this is the epitome of privilege. And as the entire time that you're saying this, like, this guy with green hair, the soldier that was going to attack mine, is, oh, well, she's just a plebeian. She's just a commoner and everything like that. We're above them. And so Ferdinand is like, okay, so you're above a commoner, so they have to do what you say. Yeah. Who's the highest ranking knight here? And he goes, you. And he goes, yeah, and I gave you an order. And it's kind of like the, oh, shit, he played the reverse Uno card. Right. This is where we learned that Ferdinand was a... Um, a knight too. So okay, Ferdinand is a mystery over here. Hmm. He's also another character that I like. I like him, but I don't fully trust him. He has a story. He definitely has a story, and I'm I'm hoping that they're going to have a third season. And third season this- confirmed. Oh, so they are going to have a third season, and I'm hoping that they explain more about Ferdinand because Ferdinand is a noble he's he he's a knight too and it's like why are you in the temple (laughs) like what's going on so he has an interesting story so anyways he helps mine so mine was very she was actually powerless because she wanted to fight back against that green-haired knight but she was worried that it would backfire like there would be a backlash against her and the church and her retainers and maybe her family too so she just had to bear with the harassment and then thank god Fernand comes in and he pulls the rank cards like okay I'm the highest rank knight here I gave you a order and you disobeyed me so even though she's a plebeian you dis- disobeyed me you deserve to be punished. And so we could tell that the green haired knight, he was like so resentful. He's like, I don't deserve to be punished. 
just because of a commoner. Then we get to the scene where after they suppressed the Turomba, like they eradicated it, thanks to, Fer- to Ferdinand, because Ferdinand like busted out his magic and he eradicated it. It was awesome. It was a great scene. But then, you know, the land, it needed to be replenished. And in order to replenish it, magic, mana had to go back into it. So that's where mine comes in. So Fernandette actually shows how important she is, how much she deserves to be a blue robe priestess by making an example of the Green Knight. So he tells the Green Knight, okay, take this staff and replenish the land. And the Green Haired Knight's like, what? You want yeah. me to do it? Yeah, because he's like, oh yeah, well I had to use my mana fixing your fuck up. So you're going to do it. Uh, I like it when he's getting it exacerbated and fucking exhausted doing it. He's like, oh, no, you're going to need much more than that. <laughs> he's just holding this stuff and you can tell he's like out of mana already. And then we have mine. So Fernanda's like, okay, mine, it's your turn. She goes to the staff and she does her prayer thing. And then whoosh, lush green spreads around instantly. Trees grow. And all the knights are like, whoa. And you you can see Fernandad giving the green hair and knight that look. They're like, what? <laughs> you got anything else to say? That and, look. <laughs> I like the fact that he's like, mind that's enough. And there's like, look, the man has been replenished a little too much, if you ask me. Couldn't have <laughs> couldn't help have that snarky comment towards her. But <laughs> he's kind of like, <laughs> I've just realized, you know, you're saying that Benno. Is Sudere? Does that mean Ferdinand's Kudere? Yeah, yeah, you can say that. Yeah. <laughs> He's the Kudere to Benno Sudere. The series on a whole isn't what you f- finish watching isn't what you start watching. No, it's not. Like the ending of season two was totally different from the beginning of season one. It could easily be a completely different series because what you had starting off as a slice of life. Isekai about books becomes something so much more. It's political intrigue. There's actually some really strong subjects in, like children that have been starved to the point of dying and touching on subjects like rape, which can be a very hard subject to touch upon in certain mediums and everything like that, but they did it quite tastefully in this. Oh, very, very. It was subtle. It's sort of like um, watching a Shakespeare play, but you can't understand. Like, some people don't understand what they're talking about, but through the acting, you kind of get an idea what's going on. So it is done very tastefully. It's not like it was, like, shoved down your throat kind of thing. Like, for example, Spirit picked up on the con- concubine mistress with Frida. I picked up on Betrothed. It's like that. Is another one like uh, Violet Evergarden. If you look at it, it's more than meets the eye. This looks like a, like I said, it looks like a kind of colourful, happy, let's go adventure, let's make books. The first episode doesn't necessarily give you an indication of what the series will become. Hell, even the, I'd say the first half of season one doesn't show you what this is going to become. No, it's not. It's not. It's like the final two episodes of season two start showing you the bigger expanse of it. Like halfway through season one, you find like, oh shit, there's magic. And then you find out, oh crap, there's this. Then a whole crap, there's that. And it's slowly adding elements in, but it's not going, here's this, here's this, here's this, here's this. So you don't get time to adjust to everything. It's adding stuff in, but it's also explaining it. So it's not a case of, Here's this just for the sake of it being this. And it's not going at a horrible pace where you just don't care anymore. I like how everything led to something. Like, Hmm. Mind's determination to make books led her to the relationship with Lutz. Lutz, aspiration, inspiration to be a traveling merchant led them to talking to Otto which led them to talking to Benno, which led them into 
making paper and making a deal with Benno, which led to Lutz being able to become a merchant through Benno, which led them to de making dealings with the Merchant Guild and Mine's knowledge from her previous world, making a hairpin for her sister, led them to Frida, which had Frida explain what the devouring was, and so on and so forth. Like, everything led to something and more. Like, it was like a domino effect. Oh, yeah, this is the butterfly effect of anime. Yes! <laughs> There's no other way to say it. This is literally Chain Reaction, the anime series. Yeah, like, something was bound to lead to another thing. Like, you don't know what it was going to be. <laughs> like, I didn't expect Frida to explain what the devouring was. I didn't expect uh, relics to come up in the story. I didn't expect mine to go into the temple. I was like, oh, sheesh. Yeah. What else is going to happen here? And it all came from mine wanting to wash your hair. And read books. <laughs> yeah. Which, I like it, but I hate it at the same time. Because the fact that she joins the church is just to read books. And I can understand it, but I'm like, that's a fucking stupid reason. Well, you know, she's not the brightest person. <laughs> well, and I think the, the author purposely did that, like giving mine the lack of common sense to lead her into these type of situations i i i was literally like i say i've been a bit of the weather so this has been my i'm gonna sit that lay down and watch this and I've more than one time just been laid in my bed just like, for fuck's sake come on while <laughs> <laughs> watching this because it all it literally all started from i'm gonna wash my hair I'm like, oh, okay. Then, oh, your hair smells pretty. Then Otto notices it. And then wants his to wash his wife's hair because she won't give this formula. And that leads him to lead into this and then to that. As Louis said, it's kind of like everything does a different thing. And each new invention leads to multiple things. Like the washing the hair leads to coming into contact with eventually Benno. The hairpin comes into... Well, Gustav's also through Benno and everything, but Frida is through the hairpin. So it's kind of like two points a meeting. And then all sort of things like she sells the recipe to this cake she makes to Frida for a year. And the reason she does it for a year is because, oh, if I die after a year, you can do what you want with it. Or if I'm still alive, I'm going to make it public. And Benno's like, you should have sold it to me, which he does with everything. It gets to the point where you're watching it where mine could fucking take a step out the door and you're like, oh shit, what's this going to lead to? Because you don't know what's going to lead to what because certain moments you won't expect to be anything leads to something. So in conclusion, it is a good story. So you should either read the manga or watch the anime. I suggest watch the anime. It's ahead of the translation. And watch the... Yeah, watch... The sub, if you don't want to hear 2D. Like, <laughs> and now it's time for the paw question. Every episode, we ask a question to the viewers, and you guys can answer it either in the comments if the platform allows it or in the Discord. The link is available in the description. And the question for this episode is What is a title that you think is overrated and why? I'm Lihua Superfina, host of Podcasts Across Worlds. You can find me on all social media platforms at Lihua Superfina. Weekly, I upload videos about video games, manga, and candy masks on youtube.com slash Lihua Superfina. I also stream every Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays on twitch.tv slash Lihua Superfina. Hi, I'm Spirit Shop, co-host of podcast across world and also content creator streamer on the channel you'll find in the description and one of the upcoming shows is tinfoil talks 
where we deep dive into bullshit in video gaming. We take a topic and we find out how it got there, why it's there, come up with some excuse until we believe it ourselves, and then put it out into the stratosphere. And that concludes our episode of Podcast Across Worlds. Thank you all for tuning in. Keep reading manga, keep watching anime, and keep listening to Podcast Across Worlds. We'll see you on the next episode. Huge thanks to my Patreons and channel members for making this video possible. If you also want to be part of the Superfina party, you can click over here or become a channel member. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next video. And I do stream live on Twitch every Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Hope to see you guys there, and I will see you on the next video. This bump. <laughs>